Ron Hawkins with the uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center, and this is this is our second uh, virtual uh, tech forum breakfast. So it's it's <coughs> YOB, uh, bring your own breakfast uh, this time. But uh, we do look forward to the day when we can get back to doing these in person, and and so please take a rain check. Um, on breakfast and, and we'll have a breakfast for you down the road. Um, I do want to make a couple of administrative uh, notes. Uh, first of all, uh, as you've probably seen, uh, been alerted, uh, we are recording uh, the presentation. Uh, we will we will record up until uh, the Q and A session, and then then we'll uh, turn off the uh, turn off the recording, so you don't feel you have to go on the record to ask your question. Now, if you do, um, if you do pose a question during the, the course of the presentation and, and, and we take that, then um, then that will end up on the on the recording. So our next uh, our next event is uh, July 16th and we have uh, Dilip Ramachandran from AMD and he's going to be talking about AMD's uh, processor technology for high performance computing. So we look forward to that. Uh, but uh, today uh, we are excited to have uh, Kunle Olakoten from Samba Nova Systems uh, talking about uh, software 2.0. And um, I did last night uh, tear myself away from uh, Netflix and uh, listen to one of uh, Kunle's uh, talks on YouTube and uh, found it found it very interesting. So I think I think we're in for a for an interesting and engaging uh, engaging talk this morning. Um, uh, just a quick uh, biographical uh, details. Um, Dr. Olakoten is co-founder of Samba Nova Systems and is the Cadence Design Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Stanford University. He's also the director of the Pervasive Parallel Lab and a member of the Data Analytics for What's Next or Dawn Lab. Uh, Dr. Olakoten is an ACM fellow, an IEEE fellow, and he recently won the prestigious IEEE Computer Society's Harry H. Good Memorial Award. Uh, Dr. Olakoten received his PhD in computer engineering from the University of Michigan. So we are very uh, pleased and uh, priv privileged to uh, have him address the, the forum this morning. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Olakoten. Thank you, uh, Ron, for that uh, kind introduction. And I uh, hate to think that I'm competing with Netflix. Uh, I'm sure I, I, uh, I wouldn't watch me. I'd watch Netflix, but you know, <laughs> just me. <laughs> OK, so this morning, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Samba Nova Systems, reconfigurable data flow, hardware, uh, some of the uh, research that we did at Stanford that led up to it. and. Uh, you know, talk about sort of next generation uh, acceleration for machine learning and other sorts of things that one wants to do in HPC. Okay, so, you know, let, let me begin by kind of setting the stage uh, and, you know, where we are today is kind of these two uh, big trends in computing. The first, uh, as most of you might be aware, is that you know the long run that we've had for the last 50 or so years with Moore's law is basically slowing down, right? The time between generations of process technology is, is uh, spreading out and, and the cost for each new node is, uh, is getting into the tens of billions of dollars. Uh, but more importantly uh, is, is Denard scaling, which is kind of the companion law, which talks about the power efficiency of uh, the silicon technology and that has been dead for a, a few generations and so now computation is, is is limited by power and the implications of this is the conventional uh computer systems that we've all grown up with that have been powered by these general purpose cpus are beginning beginning to stagnate <clears throat> so that's the first big trend the second uh big trend which you know you couldn't have missed uh in, in the tech uh, arena is is the overwhelming success of machine learning for solving some really difficult problems in in image recognition, natural natural language uh, processing, uh, and knowledge base creation. Right, and, and so 
these uh, capabilities uh, that machine learning is providing as, as having societal scale impacts. They're changing the way uh, that software is being developed. They're making autonomous vehicles uh, possible. They are impacting scientific discovery and, uh, you know, uh, HPC sorts of operations uh, are overwhelmingly being impacted by new ML techniques and they're changing the way that, 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 that medicine is being personalized. And it turns out that, of course, machine learning needs a lot of computational power for both training the models, uh, you know, training very large uh, detailed models, and also uh, for inference, especially when you want to supply or you want to serve inference to uh, millions of users. So this you know, confluence of these two big trends demands a new approach for designing computer systems for ML. Turns out that machine learning and uh, computation have been inextricably linked for a long time. So uh, if you look at the, the idea of machine learning has been around for you know, over 50 years and, and if, in fact training these uh, networks using back propagation has been around since the 1980s. Uh, but what uh, made it uh, you know, dominant is the fact that we, if you kind of look on the x-axis here, uh, where we look at, at, at uh, data size and model complexity, is that as you had more data, you were able to train larger, more complex models, and these models uh, attained higher accuracy, and this accuracy uh, you know, surpassed the uh, accuracy of conventional algorithms developed manually. And this happened both for, you know, very complex problems like, like uh, uh, image recognition and also for, for things like, like, like man, natural language processing. And what enabled uh, the ability to kind of process huge amounts of data and train these large models was the increasing amount of compute computation available, uh, typically in the form of GPUs. And so this notion of kind of training models to solve complex problems uh, instead of uh, developing uh, manually developed algorithms is known as software 2.0, right? And so software 2.0 fundamentally kind of changes the way uh, that we develop software or has the potential to, to develop, uh, change the way that we develop software. So if you think about software 1.0 as traditional software development that uh, starts by, you know, taking a problem, decomposing it into components and developing uh, manually developed algorithms in to conventional programming languages, then software 2.0, the idea is that you start with a training set and then you use that training set to develop a model and the code that gets written is written in the weights of the model, right? And so this dramatically reduces the lines of code that you need to develop and allows you to solve these very difficult problems that were not uh, possible to solve with some point software 1.0 techniques. The other thing, of course, that's happening is, is that if you want to train these huge amounts of uh, these huge models, then, uh, as I said, due to the demise of uh, Dinar scaling, we're fundamentally power limited, right? But we still need more performance and so this uh, formula, which is probably the only formula I'll show you today, you know, shows the relationship between power, uh, performance, and energy, and energy efficiency. And what it shows, that given the fact that the amount of power that we, we can dissipate uh, going forward is fixed, and we still need to increase uh, the amount of performance that we get out of our systems to train these more complex, more interesting machine learning models, that, which means that fundamentally we need to become more energy efficient, which means we need to decrease the amount of uh, operate uh, uh, the amount of energy each of the operations takes. One way to do this, of course, is to become more specialized, right? To reduce the amounts of overhead associated with doing the processing, and this gives us better energy efficiency. But of course, becoming more specialized also means becoming potentially less flexible. And so the real challenge in accelerating software 0.0 is delivering this uh, 100x to 1000x improvement 
in performance, which really, of course, has to come down to an improvement in performance per watt, since I said that the, the power is fundamentally limited because we want to, uh, uh, to enable you know, more uh, uh, ML to be used in, in, in a wider variety of applications with more capabilities. And uh, so providing this kind of performance and uh, energy efficiency increase while maintaining programmability, right? So ultimately, what we'd like is the energy efficiency of an ASIC-like implementation of our algorithm with the flexibility and programmability of traditional general purpose processes. So that is the, the tension of the, uh, the, the, the solution that we'd like. And so how are we going to achieve that? Well, it's really going to take a, a full stack uh, integrated solution that combines innovations in machine learning algorithms, innovations in the software used to translate those algorithms to run efficiently on the hardware in the form of domain specific languages and compilers, and also new hardware architectures uh, to, um, to match the needs of uh, machine learning applications, right? So these are the three elements of the uh, solution, and that's what I'm going to describe uh, the rest of the talk. And, but before I you know, delve into these elements, let me say a little bit about Sambanova. So Sambanova was founded uh, at the end of 2017, uh, and the uh, co-founders uh, are Rodrigo Liang, who was uh, a uh, VP at, at Oracle and, and basically was the lead for all the Spark uh, uh, CPU architectures developed at Oracle, and Chris Ray, who's a colleague of mine at Stanford and is an expert in, in machine learning and databases and, uh, and machine learning, learning algorithms, <clears throat> and uh, is a you know, certified MacArthur genius. And so if you kind of look at the kind of areas that we span, we span across uh, the whole stack. And so the goal uh, of, of, of San Bonova Systems is to develop a new, uh, the next generation of, of, of AI hardware to enable this greater, uh, this dramatic improvement in the, the sorts of uh, things that people can do with AI and uh, enable new ML algorithms to be developed. So think going back to, to the uh, ML algorithm trends then, let, let's, let's think about to how uh, things are, are changing. And one of the, the, uh, the uh, most dominant trends is the in increasing complexity of the models to provide high accuracy. And this is uh, quite evident uh, if you look at uh, large transformer models, which are um, completely uh, changing the way that uh, we do natural language processing, right? So starting uh, with uh, the, uh, but, uh, the GPT models uh, uh, in the middle of, of, of 2018 from OpenAI uh, through to the uh, BERT large uh, models that have been developed, what we're seeing is uh, these large transformer models are, are the best way of, of improving the state of the art of natural language processing. And some very large models are being developed uh, at uh, uh, NVIDIA. Uh, there's the Megatron uh, system for developing 8.3 billion parameter models. And they're using lots of GPUs because of course the amount of memory per GPU is limited. And uh, because of course you've got to cross lots of GPU uh, uh, boundaries and the efficiency of the compute uh, is not as high as you would like. You've got 400 GPUs using 20 percent uh, at 20 percent efficiency to get uh, to to train a 1.8 billion parameter model. And then uh, more recently, uh, Microsoft, using a uh, different way of training models, has come up with a 17 billion parameter model. And this model is uh, uses uh, a thousand GPUs uh, at uh, six percent efficiency. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, the trend here, right? You know, as we get to larger and larger models, uh, more and more GPUs are required, and the efficiency goes down. And so we can see you know, where this ends here. And so clearly, we need a different approach in training these large models 
that can get you uh, terabyte size, you know, uh, 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 parameters that to have um, trillions of parameters uh, with much higher efficiency. So, so how do you deal with these, these huge uh, 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 models and how can you make the amount of memory required to, uh, to, to uh, represent these models uh, less? Well, one of the uh, techniques that people have, have pioneered, started to pioneer in machine learning is the use of sparsity. So instead of having all the layers densely connected as shown uh, on the left here, uh, you have sparse uh, connections, so not all the connections are present. And uh, the challenge here is to come up with a model that uh, maintains the accuracy as you uh, have sparsity. And so uh, a number of uh, techniques are being uh, developed and uh, people have shown that you can uh, use sparsity to maintain the accuracy while uh, keeping, while having a large number of parameters in your model. Another example of, uh, of sparsity is the use of graph neural networks. And here, what you're trying to do is you're trying to model the world, right? You're trying to model the people, places, and things to build a more accurate uh, model of the world. And this naturally results in a sparse uh, network. And here, the challenge is to compute efficiently with sparsity because GPUs are designed uh, or, or work best when, when uh, the uh, matrices and, and the models are, are dense. And so achieving high computational efficiency in the face of a sparse network is, is the challenge. And, and so this is the thing that uh, needs to be supported by future uh, processes that support uh, the, the next generation of uh, machine learning and neural networks. And then, you know, graph neural networks are being used uh, in all sorts of applications. And uh, they're used to, to model uh, natural languages, social networks, uh, communication networks, uh, recommendation uh, systems. So you see, you look, look at uh, software 2.0, and it's providing a number of benefits, right? So it's, it's making the amount of code smaller. So it's often easier to develop uh, models uh, by, training, by training, using training data than to manually develop uh, algorithms. The other benefit, uh, of course, is that uh, the execution of the model is, is more predictable and the memory requirements are sometimes uh, reduced. So as, as an example, uh, you know, Google took their, you know, 500,000 lines of uh, manually developed code for language translation and uh, reduced it to 500 lines of data flow code. So this data flow code was uh, uh, developed using a, a domain specific language called TensorFlow. And uh, if you look at the, the TensorFlow code is in fact, uh, data flow. And so let's look at domain specific languages and see how these data flow ideas uh, are uh, expressed. So the idea of domain specific languages is uh, a fairly old one, right? So it's the idea of instead of having a general purpose language that handles all uh, sorts of uh, applications, you have a, a domain specific language that has restricted expressiveness uh, and with operators and data types that are matched to the problem at hand. And typically here, what you have are high level, uh, usually declarative and deterministic uh, representations of your application. Uh, and traditionally, uh, domain specific languages were focused on productivity, right? So the whole idea was by matching the uh, problem that the programmer was trying to, uh, to, to develop, that you could make them much more productive. The thing that we looked at, you know, at, you know, in research about uh, so to say, twelve years ago, was the idea that you know, could you get both high productivity 
and high performance. So we, we, we call these high performance domain specific languages. And one of the areas that we focused on was the idea of a high performance domain specific language for machine learning that we called optimal. So other examples of domain specific languages are MATLAB in the area of uh, uh, dense uh, linear algebra, matrix in linear algebra, and SQL uh, in the area of relational algebra. So here's an example of, uh, of optimal, right? So optimal is this language for uh, doing machine learning and, and uh, one of the algorithms that you might express is uh, k-means clustering, right? So k-means clustering here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to cluster uh, these green dots around a couple of centroids, the, the red X and, and the blue X, right? And the first thing we want to do is find out the distances of all the green points to the two uh, centroids. And so we can do this with uh, uh, a couple of lines of, of optimal. And so now you've got a, a red set of points and a, and a blue set of points. And then you're going to move the means to the centroids of these two uh, clusters. And then, of course, you're going to iterate until uh, the, uh, the centroids or the means stop moving. So a few lines of code there. Uh, and this is, you know, high level representation of the K means algorithm. Uh, and, and this we did, as I said, you know, about uh, 10 years ago. More recently, TensorFlow has used the same sorts of uh, uh, ideas and you can express uh, K means clustering uh, in TensorFlow like this. And so the key thing that we uh, discovered in the development of the high performance domain specific languages is that underlying, you know, these data flow kind of languages was a representation that we call parallel patterns. So parallel patterns allow you to express almost all the kinds of operations that you like to do in uh, data processing and machine learning as operations on collections. So these collections could be sets, they could be arrays, they could be tables, they could be tensors. And so parallel patterns give you a way of expressing both the compute uh, requirements and also uh, the access patterns, right? So uh, two uh, common uh, parallel patterns are map and reduce. Uh, others are zip, which is kind of a multi-input uh, map, and uh, flat map and group by, which are, are more interesting operators that uh, get used in data processing operations uh, uh, that are uh, such as, as SQL. And so if you look at uh, representing domain-specific languages, what you'll find out is that you'll need to support a set of hierarchical parallel paths. Right, and so you don't just have map followed by reduce, but you've got some nesting of map, reduce, group by, zip, and so on. And so what you end up with is a high-level parallel instruction architecture it, that is represented as a hierarchy of parallel patterns that uh, that that, that uh, produce a, a data flow graph. Right, so you've got hierarchical data flow graph of parallel patterns, and that can be used to represent any number of domain specific languages. They can be used to represent uh, uh, machine learning uh, languages like uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow, but also uh, data processing uh, domain specific languages like SQL. They can all be reduced to this hierarchy of uh, uh, of uh, data flow uh, of, of parallel patterns. And so given that this kind of is this fundamental way of representing the computation, then the next thing, of course, is to optimize that representation to get better performance, right? And so one of the things that you want to do, of course, as we know, high performance is all about managing memory, managing locality, optimizing locality, and exploiting parallelism. Right, and so uh, with a high-level compiler that focuses on parallel patterns, 
You can tile the computation to make it fit efficiently on chip. You can fuse computation uh, to, uh, to reduce the amount of intermediate memory. You can uh, do all this uh, in the context of parallel patterns, which goes beyond what you typically do in uh, compilers that, that, that deal with uh, what are called uh, affine loops, which was uh, formerly what people did in, in this area. You can also exploit parallelism. Uh, you want to exploit parallelism at multiple different levels. You've got a hierarchy of parallel patterns. And so there's a hierarchy of parallelism that you want to uh, be able to exploit. You want to exploit not just traditional parallelism where you're doing multiple things at the same time that are completely uh, independent, but you also want to exploit pipeline parallelism where you have a sequence of things that are dependent and you want to run them uh, at the same time on different uh, uh, cohorts of, of data, right? So this whole idea of pipelining and hierarchical pipelining called meta pipelining is important. And this can all be done in the context of uh, parallel patterns. Okay, so with this in mind, so we, we've talked about machine learning algorithms, we've talked about the trends, larger models, sparsity, uh, we've talked about uh, the role of domain specific languages and how domain specific languages can be represented by parallel patterns. Now let's think about how we might accelerate uh, a software 2.0 uh, applications uh, with, with these ideas in mind, right? So when thinking about uh, uh, building uh, software 2.0 accelerators at, at, uh, at San Bonova, three trends became evident. One, you know, we've already alluded to is the fact that the idea of putting multiple processes on the core, uh, put, so putting multiple cores on a chip in order to improve performance, whether those be complex cores from Intel or more streamlined, higher throughput uh, cores from NVIDIA is basically running out of steam, right? And so it turns out, it turns out that the more, the, fundamentally, the, the cores are inefficient. And then as you try to put more of those cores together, you get even more inefficiency. The other trend uh, that we saw is the convergence of training and inference. So traditionally people think, well, I'm going to do my training on uh, a, a GPU and I'm going to do my inference uh, on, on some very high efficiency device that, that, that might even be the uh, something specialized or, or could be a CPU. Uh, and and, the, and the, the issue here is sort of, you know, how many things am I doing at the, at, at the same time or, or how big is my back size, right? And so uh, GPUs can exploit large back sizes and maybe they're not so efficient for small back sizes. But what we've seen is this convergence uh, of, of, of training and inference because in many instances, you want to do training while you're doing inference, all right? And uh, so what you want is an accelerator that is just as efficient at large batch inference, large batch training, as I, I should say, and small batch inference. And then lastly, uh, what we, the last trend that we saw is that this idea of data flow computation is much broader than ML and data processing, that many other problems in HPC also fall into this general class of data flow operations that can be optimized by an accelerator, which focuses uh, or natively supports data flow. So we see this general applicability of acceleration beyond software 2.0. So what kind of uh, support do we need in our accelerator uh, to provide the capabilities that we need uh, for the next generation of ML compute? So clearly, I've argued that hierarchical parallel patent data flow is the native, uh, is a natural ML execution model and should be natively supported in the accelerator. Uh, the need to, do, to enable very large models to be trained is, is becoming increasingly important for these large language models and also for, for large recommender models, which uh, 
uh, uh, dominant computation in lots of uh, areas and in, in your large AP, HPC models, right? I talked to uh, people at, at uh, certain national labs and they want to, to train very large models that come from uh, computational simulations. Uh, and and uh, so that is the thing that's driving the need for terabyte size models. The use of sparsity, right? So large models and sparsity go hand in hand in order to handle very large numbers of parameters. Eventually things have to become sparse. And uh, the other uh, driver of course is graph neural networks. Uh, then uh, in terms of sort of mo uh, mapping these models to the, to the architecture, uh, there are a number of ways of, of looking at how one takes a ML uh, graph of operations and extracts the parallelism. And you want to be able to do this as flexibly as possible. You want to be able to ex exploit what's called model parallelism uh, between the different uh, elements uh, of the, uh, the graph. And also you'd like to uh, exploit what's called data parallelism, where you essentially are running uh, different sets of data on the same graph. So flexible support for mapping these graphs. And lastly, you know, as I said, data processing is a key component of the whole uh, ML pipeline and uh, supporting that efficiently is becoming more and more important. So how are we doing this uh, in, uh, at San Bonobo where we're using the idea of a reconfigurable data flow architecture, uh, or RDA. And this is an architecture that is designed to accelerate the execution of parallel patterns, right? So it's a tiled architecture. Of course, you want to come up with an architecture that's scalable. And so tiling makes it scalable and makes it efficient to implement. And uh, if you see uh, the cartoon, on the right here, there are kind of uh, uh, three key components uh, to the architecture. So the first uh, is uh, the what's called a pattern compute unit, which is where the computation, uh, it, the reconf reconfigurable computation component of the architecture. There's a pattern memory unit which uh, is, of course, you know, you see, you see multiple copies of each of these units, of course, uh, which means that, of course, that the memory is distribu distributed. So it's a, you know, naturally on the uh, on chip, the the uh, the memory is distributed. And then uh, you also have a interconnect, which is uh, a set of switches and interconnect, which uh, connects the different uh, PMUs, patent compute unit, and patent patent memory units together. And then lastly, to connect to off-chip memory, we've got uh, address generation units and units that uh, take multiple addresses and, uh, and configure them and coalesce them in order to connect and uh, to support off-chip memory. So let's look uh, in a little more detail what uh, the patent compute unit looks like. As I said, it's, it's a configurable unit, which is essentially a pipeline of SIMD functional units. And so each of these SIMD unit, units is of course capable of doing multiple operations uh, at the same time in a SIMD fashion. Uh, so that's one axis of parallelism. The second axis of parallelism is, of course, across the pipeline, right? So you've got multiple, you've got both parallelism within each stage of the pipeline each, in each of the SIMD units. And then, of course, you've got parallelism that comes from the fact that you are operating on, on different sets of data in each of the different pipeline stages. And so you've got multiple uh, uh, elements of parallelism just within uh, a, a PCU. Then the PMU essentially is a multi-banked uh, memory with a number of, of uh, uh, functional units designed for doing the addressing, right? So what you have here at the high level is a distributed decoupled access execute 
reconfigurable architecture, right? So that's a lot of words. But essentially what, what, what that uh, comes down to is the ability to uh, address independently lots of different sets of data and then stream data both within the functional units and across uh, the, uh, the network to other functional units such that you can set up computation which is very efficient and very streamlined. So as an example of, of, of how that works, uh, we see this uh, snippet of a graph from uh, a machine lear learning application. And, and you see that the different components, uh, convolution, pooling, uh, batch norm, sum, and so on, are laid out spatially on the, uh, the, the network of compute and memory components. And what you have is that you have the communication between the units is very efficiently captured by the connectivity uh, uh, between the PCUs and the PMUs, right? And so this avoids having to go off chip in order to communicate between the different kernels and which makes it possible to reduce the amount of off chip bandwidth. And, and so this is an important consideration uh, in getting very high performance. And so this data flow execution maximizes compute bandwidth by exploiting the parallelism within the SIMD units, the parallelism uh, across the pipeline and the, and the streaming of data and, uh, and, and, and between the different compute devices and minimizes the memory bandwidth because the communication is local, right? It doesn't go off chip. So the initial implementation of uh, this uh, reconfigurable data flow architecture is the Samba Nova Systems Cardinal SN10 reconfigurable data flow unit. And so this uh, chip was designed in uh, TSMC 7 nanometer, which is uh, basically the, the most uh, recent uh, TSMC process. It's, uh, it's a huge chip, 40 billion transistors, uh, more interestingly, 50 kilometers of wire, provides hundreds of ter teraflops of, of computing capability, uh, hundreds of megabytes of uh, on-chip and direct interfaces to terabytes of off-chip memory and of course to other uh, SN10 RDU uh, chips. So what this uh, gives you then in terms of programmability and efficiency is the ability to break out of the traditional uh, trade-off curve that we've seen uh, as defined by conventional uh, architectures. You know, you have ASICs, which give you very high energy efficiency, but are not programmable at all. And then CPUs and GPUs, which give you much lower uh, efficiencies in terms of uh, uh, energy efficiency, but are uh, much more uh, much more programmable because they are instruction execution based. <clears throat> now the RDU is data flow based and it's reconfigurable and so it allows you to give you get, get much higher efficiencies much closer to ASIC but it's still flexible enough that you can reprogram it efficiently for machine learning and other data processing sorts of applications. So if you think about high performance, there's this fundamental uh, you know, tension between optimizing computation and computation. That's essentially what one wants to, to manage in a high performance implementation. And uh, you know, traditionally, if you look at conventional architectures, CPUs and GPUs, uh, they haven't given you the ability to program the data or the communication, the data flow, right? So they focused on programming the compute now with the RDU, you can program both the compute and the data flow and the communication 
And this gives you the ability to get tremendous performance improvements, uh, you know, in excess of, of, of 10 times performance improvements, but also allows you to unlock applications that you simply couldn't do with conventional architectures. We call these kinds of applications zero to one applications, right? So things that you couldn't do before, now that you can do. And the key uh, idea, right, which I've already alluded to is your traditional execution on accelerators such as GPUs does things one kernel at a time. So you do uh, the matrix multiply kernel and you stick the results in high bandwidth memory. You do the norm uh, calculation and you stick the, you pick the data up from high bandwidth memory for the norm and then you stick the result, uh, you, you do the, uh, stick the result in high bandwidth memory and so on. And so there's lots of data that crosses the boundary between uh, the, the accelerator and the off chip memory. Now, the data flow spatial uh, uh, way, of course, is to lay this computation out spatially on the chip and move the data very efficiently between the kernels uh, using the on-chip communication uh, network. And so eliminates the overhead, maximizes the utilization, and gives you the ability to use off-chip memory, which has lower bandwidth, but much higher capacity, and that enables you to do things that you couldn't do before. So as an example of you know, how we uh, generate these optimized spatial mappings with our uh, software environment that we call Samba Flow, uh, we can take a PyTorch representation of the ML algorithm, which will give you a data flow graph. And if you were to just map this graph naively, uh, you would see communication going all over the place. And of course, if your communication is going to off chip memory, you don't care, right? Because you're going to pay that cost to go and pick that data up uh, in the off chip memory. and You don't care where those addresses necessarily are coming from. However, if you analyze the graph and lay out the uh, uh, graph to optimize the data flow, then you can get a very, uh, uh, very regular uh, layout, which gives you very high efficiency and very uh, high uh, utilization of, uh, of the interconnect on the chip. And the result is that, that we can take a single data scale system, right? Or, or even, and, and that, or even as small as a single RDU, and we can do, uh, and we can train models which have you know, hundreds of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, hundreds of, of, of uh, billions of parameters in, in the model. And so this training uh, mechanism that we call Salmon over one. Uh, so, you know, at the beginning of this year, we uh, announced that with a single data scale system, we could train a hundred billion parameter model. And so this enables you to take uh, what was, you know, a thousand uh, GPUs uh, with uh, represented 64 DGX2 systems and reduce it to a quarter rack with eight RDUs, right? And so doing this uh, enables you to uh, increase performance uh, and the cost performance dramatically and uh, do it uh, with a footprint and an energy, uh, a physical footprint and an energy footprint, which is much lower. And the key capability, as I've mentioned, is this ability to, to do data flow and move data efficiently on chip, uh, reducing off chip bandwidth, and then that reduced off chip bandwidth enables you to use uh, conventional DRAM as your off chip memory, which enables you to handle much, much larger models efficiently. And so you have the same programming model. So, in, in fact, in order to use uh, 64 uh, DGX2s, you've got to kind of change the programming model and figure out how to make things very data parallel uh, with the. Uh, RDU-based system, we have a single programming model which takes a, a, a advantage 
of uh, model parallelism to scale the model across multiple RDU chips very efficiently uh, so that we can do these 100 billion uh, parameter models. And of course, in the future, we're going to scale this approach. Uh, and uh, so the goal, of course, is to get to trillion parameter models. And, uh, you know, once you get to this size model, uh, the accuracy which you can get on that natural language uh, uh, tasks are, is, is, is uh, dramatic. So, you know, so I talked about the machine learning component of uh, the data science pipeline, you know, which starts with uh, training a model from the start we call uh, de novo training, where you train it from, for, from the very beginning. Uh, but typically what happens is you start with an existing model and you might tune it to your particular uh, environment, particular problem, right? So this, this uh, idea of, uh, of, uh, of scaling and optimizing a, a model uh, is uh, typically done, you know, at, uh, you know, by taking an ex existing model, maybe a BERT model or a recommended model and then tuning it for your particular environment. And so then you might deploy that model. And of course, you'd like, want to do that very efficiently. Uh, and you might do that today with a CPU because uh, GPUs aren't good at doing single batch inference. But with an RDU, our single batch inference is as efficient as our large batch training. And so you can do that uh, efficiently. Uh, you can do efficient uh, uh, inference serving on the RDU. And the advantage of, of doing inference on the RDU is that uh, there are certain models where you might want to incrementally train. And this will enable you to get even higher accuracy. So you can train them to the particular data that is actually uh, being, uh, being used. And so this capability is provided by the RDU because you have the capability of doing training as well as inference. And then if you go further uh, forward to the beginning of the data science pipeline, you may also need to do a bunch of uh, extraction, extraction transform, ation and load, ETL. And uh, in order to prepare the training data for the training exercise. And so this data preparation step is also something that the RDU is capable of doing by mapping SQL style data flow graphs to the uh, architecture in much the same way that the ML uh, uh, graphs have been mapped. Right, so here you see a much wider set of uh, things that can be done to accelerate the whole uh, data science pipeline. And this all is uh, enabled by uh, reconfigurable data flow units and the ability to very efficiently process these data flow styles of execution, which, as I said, is kind of the predominant execution model uh, across the different things that you want to do in data science. So in conclusion, then, you know, if you look at the three uh, trends that we uh, see emerging in next generation compute, uh, what we see is uh, the replacement of multiple cores on a chip with this new uh, execution model that we call reconfigurable data flow. And uh, we see how reconfigurable data flow allows you to uh, do very efficient large batch training, but also very efficient, uh, you know, single batch inference uh, because you don't need to exploit huge amounts of, of data parallelism in order to get uh, high performance. You can use model parallelism within the, 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 the graph very efficiently. And uh, furthermore, you can use the uh, memory bandwidth uh, very efficiently because you keep most of the communication on chip. And then last, the last uh, trend we saw of the applicability uh, of uh, software 2.0 compute beyond ML. I didn't get a chance to go uh, in, into a, a huge amount of detail here, but I've made the uh, case uh, that, that 
a lot of the computation that you want to do uh, outside uh, of, uh, of, of ML. I showed you an example of sort of data processing, but also thinking about high performance computing sorts of applications such as uh, FFTs, uh, you know, uh, uh, material processing uh, and the like, they all have this data flow like component. And what we have is a general purpose reconfigurable data flow architecture. And so you can map these sorts of problems to the architecture, get very high efficiency. We've got lots of compute, lots of, uh, of interconnect on the chip. And the whole result then is that you can accelerate both the ML components of your application and also the more traditional uh, high performance computing components of your application at the same time. So with that, uh, I'd uh, like to take questions. If you want to contact me, uh, you can contact me uh, at Sam Benova uh, at the following email address. Uh, if you'd like to uh, talk to, uh, to Ken about uh, doing things uh, in partnership uh, with Sam Benova, uh, you can contact Ken there. So at this point, uh, let me stop and ask if there are any questions. Kunle, thank, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. And, and I think this is really interesting to think about in the context of HPC for science and engineering and, and how it might affect both our approaches to computation in the future as, as well as the infrastructure we might put into place. So yeah, we uh, think we have a few minutes for questions and uh, wel welcome those uh, via, via chat or, uh, or voice.